All right, guys, welcome back. It has been a long time coming. We have been working on this documentary diligently for a while now. Um, we're just glad to be back, glad to share some stories with y'all. And this is actually going to be a part of a series now. Yeah. So we're going to be going around the state and going around different places and figuring out, like, who has a good enough story and who can tell something. Art, creativity, all of that, all of the stuff that encompasses something that, you know, gives us something that they've come out the mud from. Yeah. So, so this is something that we really want to take and make seasons out of, essentially. So this is, I guess you would say, our pilot. And, uh, you know, if y'all have suggestions or if you have people in mind that you want to see that you think would be a really good part of this documentary series, please leave it down below. Uh, We appreciate the feedback and the comments and, you know, all the love and support for all this hard work that we put through for this documentary. You know, it's not going to be perfect, just like everything, but it's, it's something that I think both of us hold dear to us mm-hmm. and you know we really wanted to just share these stories with you with you guys and i really hope you guys enjoy it so check it out check out it the out. mud season out one no borders let's do it My name is Joseph Hines Jr., owner of Sink or Swim Clothing Line, as well as a visual artist and tattoo artist in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I chose SOS because I wanted to use an acronym, something that was already like a, a acronym people already was familiar with, because I didn't want to do something that was too different and people not be able to kind of like grasp it. And it's kind of, it's crazy because it didn't happen overnight. It kind of was like, it took time because I wanted it to be organic. I was in India when I was just brainstorming. This was like 2019 and, uh, well, 2018. And when I came back 2019, New Year's, uh, I just, I went ahead and made an LLC for it. And it was kind of like, yeah, sink or swim. I don't really have a slogan behind it or like a catchphrase because I feel like my brand name is the catchphrase, like sink or swim. Like it's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, you know, you you strive or you fail by your own means, you know, save yourself. You know, uh, it's up to you. You know, all these things represent sink or swim and just just going after your, you know, your dreams. Like just the responsibility of you wanting to do what you want to do for yourself is all on you. Really like my first job, like doing art, I started doing caricatures at like events and stuff, like at the fair, at like anywhere that would book me, honestly. And I learned that skill through Cartoon Man, my art teacher, Keith Douglas. Oh, Joe? Shoot, Joe, Joe's the baddest dude in the rock. Hey, look, he was, I met him real young, about 13, 14 years old. He came to my summer camp at LSU. Now, as far as enthusiastic, he'd have solved so much work. He absolved things, you know, like like you see a person who get a blank sheet and you just tell him, say, hey, try to do this. He went right into it. Didn't hesitate, didn't do nothing, didn't say nothing. Guess what? So when you feed a hungry person and he was intellectually hungry, you, you he digest what you saw. Some people just gonna spit it up. He digested every bit of it. And then I saw you had hustle. I don't know where that came from, but he probably had a father or somebody in his family who hustled to catch on to who Joe Hines is. Joe creates clothes, he creates ideas, he creates 
coloring books, you know, and all that. He creates t-shirts, he got sink or swim, all that kind of stuff. Hey, he sounded just like me when I was hustling. This boy, he can create things just like out of air, you know? You know, you have a brilliant person when you have a blank sheet of paper, nothing was bad, and then he puts something on there. And plus, his stuff can make money. My hats go out to him, you know, and all that. Hey, I ain't got no son, but this is close to it. <laughs> right here, right here, he's close to it, you know? Brilliant boy, brilliant, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And he, plus, he got more to do, you know? I'm looking forward to you. You're gonna be prosperous, bro. He had a summer camp 2007, and my mom is a teacher, so over uh, the summertime, she put me in this art camp, and you know, I was like the youngest kid in the camp, and I felt like I was better than everybody in the entire situation, you know? And Mr. Douglas, he always was talking about, if you know Mr. Douglas, like he always talking about, he a hustler, like he, make, he makes money. He was the first artist that I ever met, black artist that I ever met that's making money doing art. You know, I ain't gonna blow him up too much, he, you know, but he, he, he a hustler, you know, and he goes hard and at that age, I'm 13, I'm trying to find ways to make money and trying to get fresh. And, and I got this talent, but I feel like I can't do nothing with it. And he's always in my ear telling me, man, Joe, you, you know, you can make that money, man. I'm like, you know, if you know how Mr. Douglas talk, man, make that money, you know? I'm like, yeah, let's, let's get this money, bro. I hollered at him one day, I'm like, bro, I want to make some money. Like, I want to do what you do and make some money. Like, what's up, you know, just, one-on-one -on -one after class. And he was like, you know, okay, you know, I'd give you a little chance or whatever. You know, he ain't, it wasn't a, no serious drawn out conversation, but he ended up getting me my first gig doing caricatures at an LSU event for, uh, for Christmas. And I was 13, I got like a $200 check for drawing people for like two hours. And from there, like, I was just, I was getting booked like in, in middle school, in eighth grade, I had been like drawing and stuff, like all kids, like all kids draw. But I just pursued it a little bit more than your typical kid, to the point to where at a younger age, I was just drawing a lot, you know? My mom was a professor, so we I might not have TV in the house or video games or a lot of toys, but I had a lot of paper and a lot of pencils. It wasn't until I met Mr. Douglas that I really was able to understand that I can take this, this hobby I have, you know, and really make a life off of it, you know. Uh, I wouldn't say that, it's not that I wasn't encouraged to do it, but it's very rare that you see, you know, where we come from, from Baton Rouge, uh, somebody making a, a living based off just doing art. He was the first person I ever met that encouraged me to pursue my passion. It, it was a journey, right? So it transitioned from me doing caricatures to me then painting shoes, you know? I was like one of the freshest dudes in, in high school, for sure, and people noticed it, and I kind of got a reputation for, for just being, for being fresh, for just being fly. So McKinley, like, McKinley the sickest high school in the whole state, you know what I'm saying? Best high school, best people, free dress, well we used to have free dress when I came here. Uh, I mean, you're gonna learn a lot that ha has nothing to do with school. You're gonna learn, you're gonna learn how to step out here in the real world. Like McKinley is that real, that real raw introduction to just, you know, life. You can learn a little bit of everything here, you know. A lot of, lot of, lot of time sitting in this desk like this, you know, just doing everything, you know. You can do everything right here, like you can do everything. McKinley influenced me to be a, a to finesse. McKinley teach you how to finesse and how to, you know, how to put your big boy 
your big boy pants on and and uh, you know f figure out some shit. You know, you're gonna run into a lot of hardships coming here, a lot of uh, obstacles. So it teaches you how to how to better maneuver in the real world. I feel like McKinley really taught me how to uh, how to be quick on my feet. You know, and quick and I'm already pretty quick. You know, in my in my head and thinking and stuff and thinking smart, but it. It teaches you how to be quick on your feet out here. You gotta be. You go to McKinley, you know. I don't know how it is now. The kid's different now, but back in the day, man, 10 years ago, 14 years ago, McKinley was, bro, it was fun, you know. It was fun. It was more than just high school. It's like nothing on TV could prepare you for coming to McKinley High School. You had to be there, yeah. And everybody that went to McKinley is like a family. If I go anywhere, and see anybody that went to McKinley, like it's a party because we all went through some stuff and only really we know what that is, you know? So it's kind of like, it's a brotherhood for sure. Like it's a big family. Anytime you see anybody from McKinley, it's a family. It's a big section of just McKinley people. Just based off the premise that we went to school together. And a lot of people that went to school together when they leave school, you know, it's, you just went to school with them, but man, it's, it's like a brotherhood in McKinley. A lot of people didn't spend all four years in McKinley. You know, they just couldn't handle it, man. It's, it was always some shit going on and, you know, so many distractions and, you know, you could get your name messed up, man. You do some clown stuff, you know, your reputation to be tarnished, you gotta get out of it, you know. But I was cool though, I was cool. I stayed to myself, I was cool to everybody. I rocked with the right people, you know. I played it smart, I played it cool, so. I came out of McKinley, no scratch, flawless, you know. This is it, man, legendary, bro, Big Blue. Yo. It was easy to start painting shoes and stuff because I was already into art. And the kind of sneaker thing, this is like 2000, 2011, 2012, kind of like when I think the sneaker stuff was like really super booming. And that's when the Black Cement 3s came out. And the midsoles, like if you ever had a pair of Black Cement 3s in 2011, 2012, I think they came out, the midsole cracked after like probably 10 wears, right? So I started getting into restoration and stuff. So I would like repaint your midsoles real quick, like little $30 lick, boom, boom, boom. Caricatures was cool, but then it's like I got into, you know, the fashion stuff a little bit more because I've got some money now where I could actually buy clothes and. And, and put some shit together. And now it's like, that I'm doing that and I'm, I'm fixing shoes and it's like, I'm not really doing what I want because I want to do artwork. So then I transitioned to doing paintings and I would do like live paintings at like bars and stuff. And this is like, uh, like freshman year in college type stuff. I went from doing paintings and like bars and stuff and then it's like, that was cool. But it's like, I was, I'm still trying to find my market at that point and I'm, you know, 17, 18, no one wants to spend $500 on a painting. I spent 20 hours painting, you know? Uh, so it's kind of like just me trying to find my worth and also kind of make a living doing what I'm doing and struggling to find that. And ultimately it brought me to tattooing. It's hard uh, transitioning from not tattooing to tattooing, it takes time. Uh, I've wanted to quit so many times. To this day, I still, you know, last week I wanted to quit, you know. Uh, it just takes a lot out of you, just being your own boss. And if you fall on your face, it's on you. No one is trying to make sure you're booked and, and work into the, you know. It's all on you. It's all self-driven. So I would say there's it's nothing negative about it, but it is, it's, it can be if it's not if your heart isn't in it or you're not doing it for the right reason. The motivation behind my art is is me, you know, Joe Hines and my family, where I come from. Uh, I come from some like great people. I love my people, and if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have been passionate enough to just pursue being my best self, just because I was raised to like. Raised to do your best, man. Like if I work at McDonald's, I'm gonna make the best 
Krabby Patty hamburger. Like I'm gonna always apply myself the best in any situation I can. You know, I'm not perfect. I have my moments. I fuck up like everybody else, but I do strive for excellence. And that was something that was instilled to me from my family. So if it wasn't for them, you know, I wouldn't be the person I am today. So when I think about why I do it and who I do it for, I do it for, for my family. My pops was a hustler, you know. That, that's Joe Grind Sr., you know. Pops put it all on the line for, for the family. So he really set, he set me, my sister, my mama, he set us up for, to just keep, keep the, uh, keep it going, you know. Uh, sometimes I wonder if he, it's like he knew he was gonna die the way he kind of did it, you know. But he put, he put my mom in a position to where she could, you know, take care of us two kids by herself with little to nothing when he did pass. So salute to mom. She got it out the mud and she made it happen for us, for sure. My mom is from India. She's from Mumbai, well, Bombay. She moved here when she was 20 years old, had me at 27, and is a professor at Southern University. My pops passed away when I was five. So like, that's, that's my parent. That's my mama, she everything, you know. So glad you came. I needed a break. Yeah. Been grading some papers and I definitely can use a break. How are you, son? I'm doing good. It's so good to see you. Yeah. How's the tat world coming? It's good. Just trying to stay busy, you know. Uh yeah. How's the clientele moving in? What is this like November? Mm hmm It's cool. Uh, you know, people, it's holiday season, so people they want to go buy gifts and stuff. So yeah. they come see me after they go spend their gift money, but, you know. Yeah, but they get something. It. Tattoo could be the gift that they go get, right? Yeah. So we, it's pretty cool, though. Okay. Uh -huh. You know, you are, I, you're doing an amazing thing by holding your ground and standing down and mm -hmm. being in this art circle the way you are, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I'm sure it comes with its ups and downs and its challenges and its triumphs. And mm -hmm. I think it's those down times and those challenges that make you the artist that you are today because you can either, you know, make or break. And mm -hmm. I think that you are one of those individuals who just made it through all those hardships and all those challenges. And I'm so happy and so proud of what you've become and how you have grown as an artist, you know? So this is, this is really beautiful for me to see my my young son who was drawing illustrations to growing and making a life out of what you're doing today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ma. You know, it's, you know, I got to do something out here. Yeah, that's right. Everybody has their something. path and this is your path. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it was so funny. I was thinking about you the other day. What happened? I was cleaning up my office. Uh -huh. Like, you know, it's just kind of a lot of old files and old things. And yeah, you know, you have like so many of your things around here, like your mm -hmm. art. And, no. My art, yeah, and you remember those behind you that you did, you know? Oh, yeah. You know, um, we did that, we did that painting, but now that's become a big thing on YouTube. It's called uh, acrylic pouring. Mm -hmm. So if you... Google, I remember you were showing me... Yeah, if you Google video. acrylic pouring, they have YouTube sites that's dedicated to what we did 20 years ago. And guess what else I found? I say all of this to oh. say that... Oh I found some gold treasures. And one of my favorite ones, my faves, faves, is this right here. How old was I when I did this? <laughs> I think I had to be what, maybe three or I something? I think you were three, about four? maybe maybe about five, six years old. And there's a jaguar you drew. So all your artwork, you remember these? You drew this one day when you were upset at me. <laughs> and uh, you gave me a big nose. And you see the acronyms there, MMLD, or whatever it is. It's basically, mommy doesn't love me. <laughs> this I is the day I got mad at you. Uh -huh. 
And I fussed at you about you were here in my office, and this is when my office was way over on the other side. And I fussed at you, and you got really upset. Uh -huh. And I told you to take a piece of paper and sit down, be quiet, and draw something. Mm -hmm. And this is what you did. Mm -hmm. And it was around Easter time, so you found an Easter egg and you glued it for my <laughs> nose. <laughs> and you wrote some special words here. Uh -huh. When I came out of the office, I said, What is this, Jerry? And you didn't tell me what it was, but I figured out what it was. So I have all of these, these are the things I found in my, in my little bin. Mm -hmm. So I was really happy that I'd preserved them all these years. Who would have known that this is the path you were going to take mm -hmm. into becoming a full-time artist. So what do you see in yourself? Oh my God, I see passion and fire. And I think it, when you're an artist, I think it comes with so many people just see the risks attached to it. And sometimes it's easy to get overwhelmed with those risks involved in standing on your own two feet and, and being an entrepreneur and being responsible for your business and being accountable for it 100%. And what I see in my son is the sense of deep faith he has in his skill set and deep faith that he has in himself. And I think it's, it's this tenacious behavior that he has that is just so commendable. It, it gives me goosebumps thinking about it because it takes a special someone to think that way, to have so much faith and to go so hard behind what you believe, regardless of what people tell you, regardless of how haters might be trying to bring you down, just but keeping your head up and keeping your eyes on the prize and just going for it. I think that's what I just completely adore about him, which is why I have complete faith that he's just going to do some amazing things in life. You know, he lost his father, my husband, when he was five years old five days after his fifth birthday. And uh, any child would have crumbled with that. Uh, and I'm sure this experience was very traumatic for him. And it could, I'm sure that there is a lot of trauma still associated with that. But um, he was able to, he was able to, um, you know, overcome that to the best of his abilities. And I feel like art is what did that for him. So his dad was an entrepreneur himself. His father had the first black bookstore here in Louisiana, in Baton Rouge, rather. And, uh, uh, and he strived very hard to bring multicultural books into the school system. That's what he did. And I see in Joe that same entrepreneurial spirit that his father had, uh, that, that tension to keep going, uh, believing in your, in your skill set, believing in your trade, and uh, doing what it takes to make it big. So Doc, man, Doc was like, you know, that's my daddy's brother. So, and we used to stay across the street from each other. Uh, we stayed in apartments and our apartment was right here and his apartment was right across the street. So I'm going, I go to his house all the time, you know, and, and Doc, he was, he was like, he was one of the most interesting like people I know, right? One of the most interesting men I know. And at the time, 90s, early 2000s, uh, he has like artists coming from like all over the world, like Africa, everywhere. And they, his apartment, he used it as an artist residency for these different artists he'll fly in and they'll do like art shows and stuff, you know? And, they'll use his space as like a studio space. And I go over there and it's always jumping, like it's always, you know, activity going on over there. And I'm always meeting new people, you know, men, women, and they all, you know, that, the, that old school vibe and they always showing that different type of love, you know, and I'm around all kind of different art and all kind of da dynamic personalities it always inspired me like as a kid I didn't I didn't know exactly what was going on but I knew that uh this was like some it was some culture shit like it was some it was some shit like I've never seen before anywhere else and my people are the ones that's that's setting this vibe you know so it kind of gave me like courage to just go after things that wasn't the norm because I see that's kind of what is normal for the people that I come from and you know, Doc was one of the people, like, even I remember he bought me, like, you remember those, like, art sets? 
like those foldable, you can unfold it. And they got crayons and color pencils and pastels, and they got all kind of shit. And you know, to me as a kid, like I thought this shit was worth like a thousand dollars. I thought it was like, you know, like some expensive shit. Like, you know, you get that shit from like Hobby Lobby for like twenty five bucks. But to me as a kid, I'm like, bro, this is like, this is the, the most amazing shit ever. And you know, he was one of them guys too, where it's like, Doc is an artist in his own right. And he always encouraged me as well to kind of just go after go after my passion. You know, he encouraged the arts, you know. What up, bro? What's up, Doc? Good to see you, man. Hey, yo. Well, I think they just scared to come out in the rain. Stink, though. <laughs> look, he look like he about, she about to come out. Mm -hmm. Joe, what you think about this farming business? I think it's it's very important, man. I want to uh, I want to start buying food from just Dude. local farmers. Up in Alexander, the yeah. house. Family house up there uh -huh. used to be on a 40 acre sweet potato farm. Uh -huh. The guy that ran it was the uh, premier sweet potato grower in Louisiana, a guy named Sam Baker. Uh -huh. So, from that, you know, it, it kind of uh, kind of inspired me to, to go back to, to my, my childhood roots, do uh, goat sweet potato chicken farm. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Y'all young folks don't like this stuff. Oh no, I'm into yeah. it, Doc. I'm into it just because of like, like taking your control back, like providing for yourself with your own. It's, it's a little thing, but just to have your own eggs is, is, yeah. is, is a. I was gonna ask thing. you. I was gonna ask you for uh, to come over here and like. Uh, I want to get a chicken. Like I want to get my own chicken, and bring my chicken over here with your chickens, and just get eggs from the chicken. I got a, I got two baby chicks up there now. Yeah, give me a chicken. They about, they about, they about uh, maybe four weeks old. Yeah. Uh, I remember you buying me those little art sets and stuff when I was a kid. Remember? Man, I'm, I, <laughs> that's in my distant memory. I can't. Uh huh. That's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I remember you bought me one of those art boxes. I thought it was worth like a hundred, two hundred, like a thousand bucks. One of them art boxes. I was like, man, like I. How can he afford all this? Like, this 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 is amazing, you know? 30, 40, 50 dollars. Right. <laughs> At the time it was like, man, it was like, that was like Christmas came early, I you know? I have no idea. You know, you really mm -hmm. I know it's in your bloodline, but I ain't I know you become the artist you are. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Yeah. I remember going to your house and and seeing all your art and all your stuff in there, you know. I've never been to anybody's house and seen stuff like that. And it's like to see my people have just access to so many like cool things, you know, it was like, it was inspiring. And I feel like I normalized a lot of it, you know. Me and your daddy, we used to go back and forth in the Caribbean to Jamaica and then over to Africa and, you know, mm -hmm. it just accumulated over time. Mm -hmm. so when we started out in, in book business, uh, art was part of it, so. Mm -hmm. I guess it's just, you know, it's in your nature. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if you were drawing on the wall, but you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you started it. Mm -hmm. When I moved in with you, when I decided to pursue like what I was doing full time, and I appreciate you for being like real supportive of what it is I was trying to do and the, and the, and the game you gave me and all the advice you gave me, you know. Uh, I probably wouldn't have been here at this point, if I didn't have that, uh, a lot of that knowledge you gave me, you know? Well, I mean, you, you had a lot of people around you with, with uh, understanding. Mm -hmm. The main thing was you, you were able to listen. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, uh, you can talk to them, but they don't hear what you're saying. Yeah. But, you know, you, you got the good old strong spirit, man. Mm -hmm. You're doing good. 
So I knew Alton personally. Uh, I bought CDs from him back. I had a Jeep, a 2000 Jeep Cherokee. So I had a CD player. So I would buy CDs from him every once in a while. Cause I think my my MP3 or my stuff was I was you know I was I was fucked up I was bumping the CD so I had a CD player I got CDs from him so when I found out that he got murdered you know it was kind of like and then the situation in which he got murdered you know getting killed by the cops it was like you know it's a it's a fucked up thing so I ended up doing the mural because I was doing the mural in Scotlandville with the mayor's office and. I want to do something dedicated to him. There's late news tonight about a fatal police shooting captured on camera that sparked outrage and protests in Baton Rouge, the death of Alton Sterling. No charges in a deadly police shooting that made national headlines. The state of Louisiana will not charge two police officers in the shooting death of Alton Sterling. Alton Sterling. Alton Sterling. So we on North Foster and Fairfields in front of the Triple S, you know, a very important place, Baton Rouge history, across the street from Dr. Hines' office, you know, I spent a lot of time over there growing up. Uh, used to come to this store almost every day, every other day, you know, come out here, get anything you want, man, juice, chips, candy, you know what I'm saying? Anything you need is right here. I painted this in 2016, July 5th, 2016, uh, you know, shortly after it happened. And it's been here ever since. And as you can see, everybody has added their own signature. You know what I'm saying? It's, a, it's an important part of this area and what happened, you know? And ever since this mural kind of it kind of it popularized this store, you know. It made this store like a like a legendary store. It's a legendary spot, even though what happened was tragic. It's like this this store is gonna be it's a historic spot, you know. Uh, but yeah, I remember the day when I did it. It was thousands of people out here. The whole street was blocked off. It was like a big second line, man, for a whole week. Nobody, everybody went to sleep and came right back on Foster and was out here for a whole week. Nobody got killed, nobody got robbed, nobody got hurt. There was never anything like this that happened ever in Baton Rouge, you know? Uh, to see so many people come together and it be so much peace and not be, you know, bullshit, you know? It wasn't, you know, the police wasn't hating. People wasn't trying to hurt each other or harm each other. Everybody was out here just trying to, you know, it felt like something positive was gonna happen from it, but then the flood happened and everybody just had to kind of go back to work and do what they had to do, you know? Uh, but it was, it felt like a real movement, you know? And that's the first time in my lifetime that I felt like I was a part of like an actual, like a movement, you know? Uh, yeah, I think it sparked a lot of stuff in the city, uh, you know? To this day, man, it's, people still come and take pictures in front of it. So you'll drive down the street and you'll see people taking pictures in front of it, making music videos, you know. It's almost like a like a safe haven almost, this spot right here, you know. It's like it's like you protected right here. You kinda gotta be here to feel it though, but if you've been here, you you know what I was talking about. Yeah. They had so many newscasters come in from all over this the country, right? And they would ask me questions like, how does the community feel? Like, how do the people feel? Like people from Minnesota, from all over the world, you know? And they'll ask me, how do people feel? And it was like, it's obvious how people feel. People are upset. People are, you know, people are mad. People are disappointed. But it's like, it hap we see it happen all over the world, but for it to happen right here, man, people was upset, man. Like, you know, people was upset. It was a, uh, 
it was wild to, to see something like that happen so close to home, you know, because you see it all over the news, but I don't think we expected it to happen right here. You know? And even though Ban Rouge can be wicked, it's still kind of like, you know, you, you'll never, that's not anything you can be prepared for to wake up and see on the news, you know, especially so close to home, you know. It was so important to me because this is a part of the town that I grew up in and spent so much time in and did so many things and know so many people to where it's like, if I was maybe from somewhere else or further down the way, then it may have not really affected me, but it was real personal to me because I spent a lot of time here. So, you know, definitely, definitely a lot of emotions though, a lot of emotions. talk to your dad right now. What do you think he would say about you and your work? Man, he'll be proud, bro. He'll be proud. Uh, he was like, my pops was like a all around type of cat. He was entrepreneurial, he was smart. But overall, he would be proud of like the impact that I'm making. I think that would be the most important thing is the impact that I'm making, he would be proud of. I know if my pops was here, he would have went to the ends of the earth to make sure that I accomplished all of my dreams, like, he was just like that phenomenal of a father, you know what I'm saying? And, and yeah, like, but I know that what, I, what I've been able to do without him, I know he probably like, he, he looking down, he was so proud of me, you know? Cause I know if he was here, I know it's like, I would want for nothing. But at the same time, it's like, I always think about what if and what could, but it's like, I mean, everything happens for a reason, you know? Uh, and things may have not been this way, if you know, if things was different, so. Joe, it is no lie that I love you tremendously. And uh, I have always rooted for you, uh, even in the times where I might have given unsolicited advice. I was always on your side. I want you to do, know that I'm so proud of you. I want you to never give up. I want you to stay focused. I want you to take your time. And I want you to always celebrate in the return of the Mac. Joe Pines, continue doing what you've been doing. Keep on, stay focused, motivated. You're going to have a lot of particular people who are not believe in what you're doing. But guess what? Keep on making it, marching on. Because you got all the ability, got all the talent. You're supposed to make it. You are blessed. You got a throne waiting for you. Got to sit in it. That's all. Joseph, when your father passed, you and I went on the living and threw some cakes. And the cake that you had was very high and eventually just uh, went off into space. I've seen you like that cake take off. And I know you reach incredible heights. And I'm uh, just basically proud of it. Keep on pushing. Oh, I'm, I'm not where I want to be yet. I've been on this journey for about, about eight years now, and I got a long way to go, you know, but what I've been through and what I go through, it, uh, it only makes me better. And I know that things take time, you know, and you got to stay down through your process to get to where you want to be. And, you know, time will tell. And the only thing that's gonna separate you from the next person is how bad do you want it? And are you gonna give up?
out here. Day two of the dock. About to knock some shit out. It's cold as hell out here. I got the booty shorts on. And I got these. But yeah, we about to go inside, get some interview shots, and then have a have a look around at the, at the farm. It's a nice little area. Stay tuned. Hey, what you you, you got the lens cap on, and you talking about this man? This bitch, this bitch. Hey, shut the fuck up, man. <laughs> man, this this bitch recording. He, he's running plays. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. You're running around, son? We just dosing. Dosing with Joe. <laughs> you did it, baby. <laughs> Number one. We just dosing with Joe. Chilling, killing. Talking about art and shit.